Hi everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this evening's event is the third in a series of speakers invited by the Simmons Anti-Racism Working Group, a project of the student chapter of the Progressive Librarians Guild. Uh, speakers talk about race and racism in the LIS fields. If you would like to be notified of future events or help us plan them or even have suggestions of speakers we can bring to Simmons in the future, please sign up on the sign-up sheet right over here. Today we are proud to welcome Akuna Ane, Teen Librarian at Boston Public Library's Grove Hall branch. Ms. Ane is a Simmons alum and has worked at the BPL since 2008. She has worked with several community organizations and schools in and around the Roxbury neighborhood and more recently has been a part of an outreach program to teens in juvenile detention centers in Boston. She's interested in finding more ways for social justice organizations to utilize library resources and to connect with the community through the library. She contributed entries to the recently published 101 Changemakers, a biographical anthology of lesser known changemakers with a people's history approach for middle schoolers. In 2010, as the BPL branches and jobs were threatened with cuts, she organized with her fellow union members and library patrons throughout Boston to stop the cuts. She is also an activist who has participated in local struggles around LGBT rights, foreclosures, and police brutality. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Akuna Ane. Sorry, I, I, hi. Um, that I don't have flashy like presentation things. Um, I really just want to uh, start a conversation um, here, and um, I, I think that a lot of what I will say will be a lot of broad strokes perhaps, but I hope it, it gives enough for, for discussion um, and just so, and some different ways of looking at the, uh, this issue. Um, I did want to sort of start out by saying just a kind of a general statement about public libraries. I think a lot of us uh, uh, go into uh, the library, library profession um, and especially um, go into youth services um, seeing uh, librarianship as um, uh, a way to sort of um, be a part of uh, a process that gives, um, that provides uh, kind of sort of an e equal opportunities for people to just be full human beings, especially in uh, the public library world, where people kind of go in, engage with information, learn what they want to learn, um, connect with their neighbors, um, have access to technology that they may, may not have otherwise had, um, and all of that for free. And I think that that, just on a basic level, needs to be defended. I think that's really like centrally related to, to this topic. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to start out there. Um, so um, I've been a teen librarian for um, almost six years. Um, I started out at the Dudley Square branch um, so that's in Roxbury, now in Grove Hall, it's a part of Dorchester. They're kind of sort of on the line, so you may find people who say Grove Hall is in Roxbury. It's actually Dorchester, just like, you know. <laughs> 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 she knows. Um, and um, both areas are uh, majority black, uh, working class, uh, and poor uh, neighborhoods. Um, uh, so what I, what I want to do for the, um, just to kind of tell you where I'm coming from, um, what I want to do here is kind of talk from a public librarian's perspective. Um, so there might be things that I leave out, but uh, this is kind of, that's my experience and it's what I know. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, and um, what I want to go into is um, some things uh, about um, very, like, related to the library pro librarian profession um, and uh, racism within it. Um, but then also take a step back for a little bit and also talk about um, uh, racism um, in society um, and uh, how that's connected to what's happening to the public sector, um, public libraries, uh, because I think that that's something that librarians really should talk about more um, to help us figure out some of these difficult questions about how do we, how do we uh, uh, figure out, um, how do we approach racism within our our profession within our work. Um, so some things that might be quite familiar um, to us, um, but I, I want to lay it out anyway, I think it's worth saying that, um, you know, we are in a profession that is largely white. Um, 
um, just looking at some of the ALA stats, um, and um, correct me if I don't have the latest, but 88% um, of um, professional librarians are white, 5% African American, 3% uh, Asian Pacific Islander, 3% Latino Latina, and 1% Native American, um, uh, or other uh, combinations uh, of ethnic identities. Um, and uh, for folks who are in school, uh, only 4% uh, uh, of those folks are African American or Latino, Latina, Asian. Um, and um, um, I guess here I kind of want to say, like, in my experience, my first job, um, I was uh, uh, in a black neighborhood with uh, mostly black staff um, and mostly black librarian staff. Um, and um, that had uh, a huge effect on me um, in terms of just being able to um, connect with other librarians um, and their experiences in neighborhoods like the ones that I grew up in. I didn't grow up in Boston. I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. But uh, there's some similarities to Roxbury um, and, and Dorchester areas. So have, being able to connect to some of that, um, meeting kids who are like, oh, you know, like, we can talk about some of the same things. Um, uh, I'm Nigerian, I'm Nigerian American, so like kids who are from immigrant families, like you're Nigerian, oh my god, like being able to connect on some of those things. Um, music, which is one of my big loves, um, being able to connect on uh, just some of those things uh, was really important uh, for, for me to get um, a sense of one of the key things that you want to do as a librarian is just like talk to patrons and figure out what are their interests, what are their needs. Um, so that was helpful um, for, uh, for my work. Um, but also challenging because uh, this is a neighborhood that is underserved um, in many ways, uh, not just the library, unemployment, um, uh, uh, the schools in, in the area. Uh, when I first started, there's a middle school up the street that uh, didn't really have a library. They had sort of a, a person there who, uh, a techie, uh, the way I like to call it, a techie, uh, who, was, who decided he was going to help run the library, but he didn't know anything about running the library, so he asked for my help. But um, it, was, it was difficult because that meant that the middle school kids actually didn't have a library. Um, and so kind of dealing with that, uh, you know, knowing that a neighborhood kind of like the one that you grew up in, like there's a, there's a, a lack of, of resources there, um, and it's kind of an isolating experience. So I, I just put that out there to say like, um, that's kind of the challenge of not having a profession that is, is more diverse, um, something that we need to work more towards, and I want to talk a little bit about later. Um, and uh, uh, something else that we might be more really familiar with is just sort of the amount of uh, diversity in uh, just the literature, um, in, t in teen literature. Um, um, I don't know if you guys know Melinda Lowe, author of the Ash series, awesome. She has a blog, um, Diversity in YA, which looks like Diversity in Ya, which I really like. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, she talks about, she just kind of looks at the, um, the um, best fiction for YA. And, um, she's since I don't know how many years she's done it, but I know she did one last year and she did one this past year, uh, for this past year, um, and just um, kind of talked about how you know 10% um, of the, the books picked were by authors of color, um, and um, 50, 50, excuse me, 15% of the books had characters of color, 3% um, of those books had black characters, um, Latino characters, Asian characters respectively. And that was just on race. She also detailed um, LGBT um, characters um, who are disabled, um, differently abled. Um, and uh, uh, I, you know, it's uh, important to look at that because you know, part of my, our job is making a, a collection that, um, is for, that uh, speaks to the people that we serve. And um, that is difficult when what's out there, what's suggested, is not um, something that um, represents um, the people that you serve. Um, you could sort of imagine what it means to kind of, um, you know, when kids look on the shelf and they're like, oh, well, that's probably not a book that will interest me. Um, uh, just to say, of course, there's a variety of interests. They're not, like, not every black teen is looking exactly for a book that's like about me, like this book is about me. Um, but um, it does matter. It doesn't matter that there's the, 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 uh, those books um, exist. I've had a number of teams just kind of say, well, I don't know that these books are interesting, to, are interesting to me, but I know that there could be some. Um, so um, that's the impact of, of that reality on, on, our, on our work. Um, but you know, 
okay, so then that's the reality of our profession, um, but who do we actually serve? The people that come into the library, overwhelmingly teens of color. Um, I would say they're the majority of people that use the library. Okay, so that was a cute experience. I was in Oxford and in Dorchester. In Charlestown, it may not be the same, uh, but I, I, I think system-wide, Boston is uh, a majority people of color city, actually. Um, these are the people that use the library. Um, um, and some, some of the ALA studies talk of, uh, about um, a larger percentage of, of, of uh, Black, uh, uh, black, black, excuse me, black <laughs> families, um, Asian households that use uh, the library for school assignments, use the library for um, uh, computer internet use, um, and this is largely the, the folks that I see and what they're doing. Um, so to to talk about, I guess to me that means to talk about teen libra librarianship is actually. Uh, and um, the racial dynamics within that is actually to really talk about, to, we're confronting racism. We're actually talking about racism and its intersection in, in the library because these are the people that, that use it. If we're not figuring out um, how the profession can be more diverse, how some of the literature can be more, uh, more diverse, more representative, um, then we are you know, we're ignoring the, the very population that we're, we're serving. I think that's just important to, to keep in mind. Um, and so um, from there, I do want to go uh, talk a little bit too about um, some of the, the factors in a way kind of beyond the library walls that I think impact our, our service. Um, and if I could read my scratches over here, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, especially being in the public sector that I think right now, um, since, um, especially since the economic, the hit of the economic crisis in 2008, um, has seen um, huge, huge uh, cuts uh, to it, or restructuring in a way where there's a, there's a sort of, a, you sort of feel like you have to sort of maintain the same level of services, but um, on the cheap with less staff. Uh, with less resources. Um, that's kind of what's happening in the public sector. And um, you know, if the folks that we are serving are largely people of color, this will have a direct effect um, uh, on how we approach the, the, the field and also our patrons and what they, what they get out of it. And just to go through what that looks like, um, the economic crisis was the largest, was actually the largest, uh, the housing crisis, sorry, was actually the largest transfer of wealth from rich to poor. Uh, uh, in American history, um, and uh, that was largely out of the, the, the homes of, of black families here uh, in, in the U.S. Um, so um, that's kind of the situation that we're, we're, we're dealing with, with the people that we're, we're working with in, in our communities. Um, and, uh, you know, the public, public libraries haven't escaped the crisis. Um, there's, um, there's been sort of a... Um, just looking at some studies, there's been uh, uh, every year since 2008 an increase in cuts uh, statewide um, in, in public libraries. Uh, so um, while you may not see like an individual city being uh, cut at um, statewide, you can look and see how, how there's been a cut. Um, so for so 42% um, of states uh, report funding decrease every year since 2008. <clears throat> Um, uh, how has that impacted teen librarianship directly? Um, so, uh, no library, no teen, <laughs> no teen, no teen services. Uh, also, but also um, the lack of staff. Only a third of uh, public libraries have a dedicated teen librarian. In Boston, um, I want to say it's only seven of us for the twenty-four uh, branches. Um, there's not a teen librarian in every in every branch, um, and um, being stretched in that way um, means that at times there are teen librarians who can't actually do their, you know, can't be the dedicated teen librarian in their branch um, for a day, for a week, um, uh, covering other departments or covering yeah, basically covering other departments within the branch. Um, uh, and this is especially a reality across the country in communities of color. 
So you think about it, um, you know, we, we want the profession to be more diverse. We want to see a collection that's more diverse. Um, but some of the, like, having a public library where you can say there's a librarian there, I know them, I know what it's about, I know what I can access at the library, but that's kind of stripped. Um, not just public libraries, but, um, you know, think about the cuts to schools. Actually, there's a school right by me, now that I'm thinking about it, that um, will be going, um, um, won't be closing, but will be going under the uh, state receivership, the Holland. Um, so, um, uh, just to say that there, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, general sort of uh, crisis for the, for the public sector to not have uh, the library uh, there, so that you could point to it, point to it and say this is an experience that I had. It's positive. I would like to be a librarian someday. That directly impacts this conversation that we're trying to have in the in in our field about um, how do we diversify. Um, so I think that's something that we need to talk about and think about. Um, beyond that, um, uh, you know, 22 percent of all children um, are in the U.S. are below the poverty level, um, um, and unemployment for youth uh, 16 to 18 uh, is 22, 23 percent. Uh, which is higher than the national average and of course disproportionately affects uh, young folks of color. Um, so this is a, a, a time period in which all the more so um, folks of color have been sort of marginalized, um, literally, not just in the way that they're viewed by society, but like, you know, but um, schools defunded, libraries defunded or taken away, um, uh, uh, impoverished, um, without jobs, uh, the idea that you can participate in, in society or that you matter to society kind of sort of taken away from you. I think that directly affects our work. Um, and uh, this sort of, I think there's, you know, kind of a, 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 a correct uh, sort of uh, uh, move to looking for uh, youth, incarcerated youth and in our services to them. Um, but, um, you know, one thing that we have to think about is that uh, 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 incarceration rates for for um, for youth of color are are quite high. Um, the in general they've been decreasing, but for for um, Black and Hispanic youth especially, uh, uh, sorry, reading off the paper, more than seventy percent of those involved uh, in school related arrests or referrals to are, are sorry that left, left my sentences. So more than seventy percent of, of Black and Hispanic students um, uh, who were involved in um, uh, school-related um, issues like suspension um, lead to arrests or and directly into um, sort of the arms of law enforcement. So probation um, kind of being followed up by uh, by the criminal justice system. Um, what does that do for uh, for the for the consciousness and the the um, um, uh, the self-confidence um, in community and in the in our society for? for um, African-American, Hispanic youth. Um, I think that's something to, to really chew over and think about. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I've sort of detailed some things. I, you know, there's a number of ways that we can sort of look at that, but um, I, um, I think without seeing that, it just becomes a conversation about our attitudes toward people of color and not, um, you know, when they walk in the door, what is their, what has been their experience in the world? Um, if they don't walk in the door and they're like in a library, why would I go? What has been their experience in, in the world? Um, and uh, on the professional side of it, um, are, are you able to um, get a degree? You know, that's kind of more of a question for, for, um, for um, what's traditionally called young adults, like the early 20, 20 year old folks. Uh, that's more of a, a pressing question. Are you actually going to get uh, a degree? Um, are you going to get to be able to get a, an MLS um, to be, you know, whatever, to help diversify the field? These are pressing questions for us. I think that we can actually make some headway around those things. So I want to start to talk about, um, I think, broader things that I think that I, I, I'd like our field to think about doing, um, and also maybe some practical things. Um, on the or, yeah, on the practical side of it, I think that um, um, it does, you know, it does matter that we are looking to um, um, organizations that consciously compile 
uh, uh, lists and resources uh, for, um, for teen patients of color, uh, for youth of color. So um, actually in putting together information for this talk, I didn't realize how much there was. <laughs> um, and I, I think that, you know, it's, it, um, it, it, we, sh we should really think about like uh, put it, pulling together those resources and putting them out more, especially as we're in school. Um, not in school, but you know, as folks are in school, um, uh, looking to um, these resources. And one thing I found was the um, the cooperative. Um, hope I don't get this title wrong. The cooperative for children's uh, the cooperative children's book center that actually has um, studied uh, the number of children's books. Uh, uh, by and about uh, African Americans since 1985. Um, they also have uh, book lists, and one thing that I find helpful is they, they have um, at least like a, I think it's for the week, a book of the week um, and a review. And why I find that helpful is because in my work, you know, we, we select books through a vendor, um, and sometimes these books are not there, um, or they're not reviewed, and so you're not really encouraged to buy. You don't feel you don't feel comfortable buying a book that doesn't have a review. Um, but um, you're also not encouraged to buy books that are, <laughs> that don't have a review. So it's helpful to have some reviews of, of some of these books that don't that um, may not appear in in the vendor uh, that you're buying from, um, and just a list and a direction. Um, in terms of um, programming, I mean this may seem sort of like duh, but I you know talking to people. <laughs> It, it's it's really necessary, um, and um, there's no training for that in the, li in the library school. But you get thrown in, and you realize you have to do it. Um, there was this one example from it's on the children's side of things, but um, uh, in um, I Multnomah County, uh, where they instituted uh, Black Story Times, um, and um, which caused some controversy. But um, the way that the library went about it was sitting down with uh, community groups um, and talking about, well, what is it that the black community wants from the library? And it came out that there was, the, um, there was a desire for more story times that were geared toward the black experience in full, and not just in February, but um, more often. And so they came up with black story times, and they called it black story times. Um, and it's actually been something really positive for that, for that, uh, uh, for that uh, library system. Um, and, um, you know, at Dudley, um, which is where I spent most of my time, which is why I keep going back to Dudley, um, we, um, we had to do that because I think that there was an experience there where people sort of felt like, well, what, what can the library do for, for me? I'm just here, you know, I'm just here kind of hanging around. Um, we have a group, we have still to this day, a group of chess players that come in every day, play chess, and there are folks that have been in the neighborhood forever. Um, and I think when I was, I think 2009 or so, we started saying, hey, what do you guys want? <laughs> what do you guys want the library to do? And they were like, I have an idea for a program. You know, and like every year now, they do a program where it's kind of just like, I didn't know this about them, a bunch of them are artists, so they do a program where it's like an art program. And it's kind of an open mic thing, and it's like positive community type thing. Um, but that's, you know, that's a form of literacy that we should encourage. Um, and, um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, I think that's one example of, of, of how, to, how to kind of address um, that in, in the library through programming. Um, um, there's more I could say about that. Some bigger, um, um, okay, a couple, uh, couple things. Um, uh, I think working with your colleagues in your union, I think may not be sort of, um, uh, an immediate go-to, but I think it's really important. Um, just um, stepping out of the library for a second, looking at um, the Chicago teachers who, like, um, you know, that was a community affair. When they went on strike, it wasn't just about them and their, their pay, that was very important. It was about the community, it was about fighting racism. Um, a huge number of teachers in Chicago are African American, uh, but also um, the schools that are, were threatened um, and were underserved or are in communities of color. And they had spent years working with those communities and um, being a part of um, activities where, that were, folks were going to city council meetings and saying, don't close my school. Um, and they were part of, you know, the teachers as a union were a part of those things. 
Um, I think that librarians can do a similar thing. Here in Boston, that's what we had to do in 2010 when we were facing some closures and some layoffs. Um, it mattered that we connected with some community groups. Um, I remember one really awesome event was there was a, there was a read in, in Eggleston, at the Eggleston branch. Um, I think 60 people came out to the uh, to the branch, and if you've ever been in there, it's a small branch, so that it looked like it was gonna um, spill out. So, um, and it was like there were community groups I'd never met, I'd never heard before. Um, they're kind of defending the library, um, and also um, I think the librarians got sort of a sense of confidence that like what I'm doing is right. I don't have to just kind of go along with these cuts. We can work together with our communities and. and um, defend what we what we deserve. Um, and within teen, teen uh, services, um, I think that there could be way more done to just say, like, we need at least a teen librarian in every branch. I think that well, a lot of my colleagues agree with that, but it's just trying to figure out, like, how do we, how do we get together to push for that? Um, but um, uh, I'm not sure that every um, colleague sees the union as a place that we can have, where we can have that conversation. So I encourage people to kind of look to that if they get into positions where, you know, they, they have the opportunity to be in a union. And then, um, last thing, I think that um, librarians, um, you know, I've been thinking about this. There's nothing necessarily, I think a lot of us come into the, the profession, and maybe a lot of us <coughs> in this room have a lot of progressive ideals um, that we come into the profession with, but I don't think that in and of itself it's progressive. Um, and um, I think that it requires that folks who come in with some of those ideas to, to, um, to, to push for, for certain things. That's why I kind of talked about unions, but also, um, you know, um, I think there's, there's certain things that we should try to figure out how can we take a stand on this. So like with mass incarceration, and just what I talked about in terms of how that impacts youth of color um, and directly affects our work. Um, you know, we want to figure out what kind of services we, we deliver, but also, I think we should oppose the fact that disproportionately African American, Hispanic youth are being caught up in the criminal justice system. Um, you know, today, it, it, there, are, there are more people caught up in the criminal justice system than were enslaved in 1850. That's, that's a crisis right there. Um, and I think librarians should, you know, in their organizations, in unions, um, should figure out how do we take a stand around that? Should we? We should discuss it. You know, I think we should discuss that. Um, another thing I was thinking of is our with our connection to public schools. Um, uh, some of the initiatives that have you know, we've kind of dealt with some of the same things, especially throughout the economic crisis, um, the closure closure of schools and libraries, and sort of the um, uh, minimizing of the services that we provide. Um, which um, impacts, you know, there's a, there's a relationship between how that impacts us. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that, in, that has been uh, a, sort of a, a struggle around uh, uh, public education has been uh, the increased standardization. Um, and there's been a lot of opposition to um, Common Core, um, which is a set of standards that um, um, states are, are being told if you agree to these then you can have access to some funds um, and um, I feel like in the library world it's more like great common core standards we have some way to be more relevant um, I want to you know I want to talk about that I think that we should be way more critical of some of these things um, as um, especially because I think our allies are in the schools um, in terms of defending our public resources <coughs> um, our public libraries um, also, because I think that in terms of uh, the discussion of uh, and the discussion of racism in our profession, um, the sta standardization hasn't actually helped uh, people of color um, because um, the the resources haven't been shared. You know, haven't been evenly shared. So you've got the set of standards that everyone is supposed to meet, but like in, in communities of color, the resources aren't aren't there. Um, and so it becomes a way to kind of say, all right, your school closes, your school closes. I think that our profession should talk about some of these things and be a little more uh, critical because it's, um, you know, a part of our lifeline is kind of um, being attentive to the, 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 the issues that our, our patron population faces. Um, and then our allies in, in the schools, I think the teachers um, and, and the folks who work in the schools. 
So um, again, broad strokes I feel like, but I, I think some things that I, uh, the, our profession should discuss and um, I hope some of that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And now we'll take some questions, if anyone would like to ask them. controversy over that title, over something like that. Um, but I think that's great that there could be a program that reflects the actual community you're working with. So what would your thoughts be, or anyone's thoughts be about um, if, the, if the staff is white and they want to do a program like that because it reflects the community, what, what route would you what would be the ways of going about that? So you can, you know, reflect your patron needs. And Let me just please. Yeah. Um, um, in that particular um, um, case, whatever. In that particular instance, um, the woman who was who was just hired for that children's position was an African American librarian. Um, but I think the, the really important part of that story for me was that the, the library sat down with um, community groups to kind of figure out um, what exactly, or what kind of programming um, would, um, does, does the black community here want and need. Um, and from there, the idea about calling it black story time came. So other ideas might actually come from a discussion um, with a with a white librarian um, or a librarian from a different uh, racial background, um, talking to um, black community leaders, perhaps I don't know, but I think it, it, um, it was really the connection with uh, community groups um, and having that conversation about what it, what is it. It's not always going to look the same. I think is what I'm trying to say, and that it's it's really important to read it in what are the, the needs of the the patron the patrons and the community. Well, kind of going off of what she was saying, um, if so, I understand like the you know you're talking with your community and, and you're working through it that way, but if it were to have a title like that, how like I worry that even if the community group and not the librarian chose the title of the program. Like, I can't think how to word this. Um, I feel like that would be something that would be maybe hard to defend for the library to like defend to the public. It's like, well, these people, you know, this group who wants this resource and wants this programming and uh, who we're trying to serve and you know help them feel involved and help everybody. Know, actually be of service to everyone in our community you know they chose this title but I feel like if it's coming from what could be a predominantly white staff that that would be misconstrued as like a negative title like I don't know how that would kind of work a different situation obviously in the situation that you had that wasn't the case but I guess it's not really a question so much as a comment <laughs> Yeah, isn't there a publication um, of books by blacks that come out every year at the Boston Public Library? The Black Is List? Is that what the, is it called? You're, you're talking the list or the yeah. Black Is List? And, and what is it called? Black Is. Okay. And w wouldn't that be a way that you could enter into a discussion saying we have something that is already in use? That but, but I agree with you how important it is to engage discussion and education and input from both the white staff as well as the community. And also, is there something you can hang it on to? Right. I think 
think also one of the things that, that makes me think about is like, there are so many like buzzwords that get thrown around in this profession, like diversity and multiculturalism and you know all of those things. And I think ultimately there is power in naming things what they are, which is people are very resistant to doing this in this, you know, in this profession. But at the same time, we also have all of these like words that we could use to shape, you know, a, a program like that, like that could make it very clear what it is and not say that, you know, so like to kind of get hung up on like the naming of it is sort of secondary, I think, to just like having, like creating those spaces, creating those relationships. Like we could call it, you know, I bet like if we just brainstormed right now, we could call it 50 different things right. that would like be, make it very clear. It's black story time. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, so like, yeah. Uh, no. I apologize in advance for commenting and leaving, but somebody's got time. Um, so I just wanted to comment on the, the conversation about black story time. And um, I think part of the difficulty is that we're living in supposed, a supposedly post racial society, which means that we're not supposed to talk about race, even though it's the most obvious thing. You want to say better for the hook? Um, it, even though it's the most obvious thing, right? Um, and <laughs> I think that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about, um, which is th there are there are things that go beyond. If we're talking about social justice, we have to go beyond the library. We have to talk about actual social change, um, which is I think really important to have. It's also a really huge one. But being uh, clear in our language is is I think a, a, an easier. Thing. I mean, if, if you go to the Dudley branch of the library, it's like it's black people. It's a black neighborhood. Let's say that. You know, and let's talk about the, the reality um, of that library. So I, I think that that'll be like public sector, everybody, but public sector workers in particular have I really think a really important task in pushing back against the notion as a post-racial society. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're glad to leave inconspicuously. Yeah. <laughs> let's see, come at home. <laughs> agree and I also feel like I'm also coming from a perspective where like I might be working in an all-white space I might not be working in a place where I have the freedom to speak honestly and plainly you know and I have to kind of be a little more devious or a little bit more you know roundabout in the ways that I address things and I think for me, it's important to create the spaces and have the conversations. And the language is really important, but it's a piece that, if I have to compromise on that, I will. Like to to try to make those spaces happen, you know. So I guess that's where I'm also coming from is like wanting to like push the language further and push the conversation further, but also knowing that there's a long tradition of like librarians of color and black librarians like using the resources they had and doing what they could do to like, you know, create the spaces that they could in a fairly hostile, um, you know, profession. So in that, in that sense, like, I don't necessarily, I won't feel like I'm doing myself an injustice if I just, you know, if I call it multicultural story time or whatever, like, it's going to be a story time, it's going to be, you know, like something like that. So, Yeah. 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 I also. I mean. Um. I. I totally hear that. Um. So. Um. Moving from Dudley to Grove Hall, the composition, the racial composition is different. There, are, for the most part, the staff is. Or people of color, um, if you include the the non-librarian staff, um, but. Um, 
brand, you know, supervisor is, is white, adult librarian, white. Um, these are the two faces that you see when you walk into the library. It's a different mix of things. Um, I still think in a lot of ways it's like, like making the space to have some of these conversations. We're at Dorchester. We have, in some ways, it's like, let's not ignore, you know, um, so small things like uh, we have to submit our flyers for our programs uh, before we put them out. Um, and at times, we get them back from, uh, from the folks who are checking our flyers, all white faces on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that was kind of a, a, a good opportunity to talk with coworkers and be like, all right, this is why we need to change <laughs> this flyer, <laughs> and we need to make us think about it. Um, and we, you know, we, uh, it's understood amongst the staff, that's what we will do. It's a small thing, but it, it's a way to start to talk about why is it important to actually represent the people that we're serving on a flyer, you know. Gosh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, sorry. So you mentioned that, um, that one of the things that you don't necessarily learn in school is how to talk to your patrons. So, um, so do you have any ideas about how we could bring that more into the curriculum? make you all go out and talk to patrons? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, I guess I started to feel when I, when I was like maybe a year, and I don't know, maybe different library systems are different. Maybe there's more training or something or more time to just kind of figure things out in different systems. But I, I felt like when I, I got my job, which was actually a couple months after I graduated, it was like, go in, fly, do it. <laughs> and I was like, OK, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so um, me, I, I kind of felt like it would be great to figure out if there can be internships. I don't know how to we have them work on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's and they're yeah. and they're they're required. <laughs> okay. So. Even for youth services or yeah. yeah. Also, okay. Everybody, that's one everybody, thing. That everybody help. get well. Everybody has the opportunity. Yeah. Most people have to do it. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that would help if it was like part of the program. Mm -hmm. I I definitely try to. Uh, work in libraries while I was in school. It was hard. It was hard to find an opportunity to do that. So if it's part of the program, yeah. then it comes back into the classroom too. Like I said, this this is what other you know. Yeah. This is what the patrons said. Well, I wonder if um, part of that of, of talking to them, of talking to patrons or learning how to talk to them. I feel like that might. I wonder if that depends on like the size of the library or the type of library that it is in terms of the community. Like I, for instance, I work at a small branch library. And so even after just like a month or two of working there, you pretty much get to know the people and you see the regulars and you're chatting with them and you're talking with the community. But I feel like if I were to be working at like a larger scale place, there might not be that chance to really know your community. So I wonder if that might be like an incredibly valuable experience as well for people who are like trying to learn about how to do that is to go into those like smaller, I don't know if that matters or not, or if that is something that is learned more quickly at a smaller place than at a larger place where you might not be seen all the time, you might not see the patrons all the time. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah, more of like a, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense though, yeah. Um, I mean, I started out in a branch, which, it's one of the larger branches in Boston, but it's a branch and it's in the neighborhood. We see the same people, so that's that's a helpful experience. Um, I think, in terms of like this discussion about race and, and racism, um, race and racism, <laughs> team librarianship. Sorry, I was just thinking of the title. Anyway, in terms of this discussion, um, I think um, why I guess I want to say why it matters. This idea of like having conversations with patrons is because of the idea that like in larger society for people of color it's like you don't actually matter. Um, in fact, a lot of times people kind of come into the library assuming that this is just a place where you're gonna maybe give me something, but for the most part, I don't, I don't really, you know, whatever. You, I don't really deserve much. So like, if there's a facilities issue, sometimes people don't even say that like. Um, you know what, I couldn't use the bathroom, <laughs> it's broken. Because they're like, it's broken, that's kind of what the way things are here. Um, so I think it matters in that kind of context to, to, tr to try and, and talk and, you know, talk to your colleagues about it, I think, as well. Um, 
Another thing that um, we uh, try to do is uh, have um, uh, diversity trainings in our amongst our staff, which could be a great experience and a really <laughs> difficult experience. <laughs> our experience was a little difficult because it was coming from the city, and what librarians wanted, which I think made sense, what my colleagues wanted was um, community groups to come in and do trainings with us. So then we were actually seeing people who were from the neighborhood and or and or new people from the neighborhoods that where we worked and could just talk about anything, like any kind of like like my one of my coworkers said that um, she was trying to tell um, one of a, a, a child to, you know, to stop doing something. And when she was talking to him he like wouldn't look at her and she thought it was rude. And then she learned later that that he was a, a young Haitian boy that, that he should he was, he's been taught not to do that. And that's kind of part of part of their culture. Um, you know, she learned that from another Haitian teacher. She was like, I wish I had known that because I got so mad at that kid. You know, like just kind of stuff like that, but like any kind of question. Um, I'm rambling on about this, but I, <laughs> I think that, you know, that's kind of what we, um, I think it's particularly important when we're talking about racism in the field. I'm sorry. I'm curious, do you get any formal or informal feedback from uh, team patrons in Dudley or in any of the Boston branches? And if so, what does it look like? Um, um, often, more often about uh, the programming than I do about um, the collection, and what that looks like is usually like, when are we doing that again? Um, I really like that. Um, the teens that I work with now are mostly 12, 13, and they like a lot of craft programming. And they also just want to talk a lot about their day and everything. Um, so any opportunity that we can just like sit and do things and then they can talk. They like. So after that, the, that's how I know that it kind of, it worked out. Um, I think there should be, probably on my part and uh, throughout the system, more of a efficient channels for that kind of feedback. But um, I like that kind, <laughs> you know. Um, about the collection, I have to sort of seek it out. Um, so if I suggested, um, I'm really into horror these days, so if I suggested a bunch of horror novels to uh, a team patron, and when I saw her next, I was just like, how did it go? What did you think? Um, I have to, yeah, I think there probably is an assumption that, like, I'm not going to. And she was actually like, how did you remember me? Like, we talked. <laughs> we had a conversation. Of course I remember you. Um, so that's. Any more questions? I have one. Um, so I feel like I've had a lot of conversations recently about um, statistics and, and gathering statistics for, you know, to figure out if the program is working or, or however um, that works. How have you done that um, in your work, <laughs> I guess? Okay. I have not, and it's not because I, I don't think it's important either. It's just um, it's um, not a part of regular practice, um, and um, in some ways, other things go in the way. I mean, we we collect we say this is how many people came to this program. We have to do that sort of uh, monthly on a like a what do you call it institutional level or whatever send that in. Um, but for my own personal life, all right, it's for me it's it's all anecdotal and like experiential. Um, and um, that may not be the most efficient way to do it, uh, but I haven't. Does the EPL in general do um, like statistics collecting about um, about their patrons and about like circulation numbers and things like that? Yeah, we yeah. have to. We have to do that. Did you release it? Do they release it, or is it internal? Um, I don't think it's. I think it's internal. I don't think that you can. Um, I'll have to check. But I don't they think submit them to the state. Yeah. yeah. They submit st yeah. state statistics seriously. Yeah. But I'm not sure if you could just go on the every every annual report. I mean, yeah. The, if it's a public institution, they have to. Mm -hmm. 
that yeah, I mean it's a public institution. So somewhere, somewhere, and probably in the annual report, they would have those kinds of statistics. Well, the um, Mass Board of Library Commissioners maintains and compiles those statistics oh, right. that yes. are related to circulation yes. and, right. and, um, and they and make them use of, of resources, and they are public, and they're um, done down by library system and branch. Also, there's the public library uh, data survey, oh, the public library survey, yeah. and uh, oh, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the one thing, like breaking it down in terms of race and ethnicity of patronage, I don't think no. anybody's really got that because it would be, it has the potential to be a privacy infringement, and um, you know, the, I'm not sure if that's yeah, it's data not in your library, library card. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, that's right. not that piece. That kind of data isn't collected in your library card. Yeah. Uh, even age, I'm not sure. Is, mm -hmm. I mean, they kind of can. Yeah. You can but see, that's all of that self identification. That, You're not yeah. going to ask it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if it's on the life, if it's on, not the, trust, the age, if it's on the license, we, where I work. Yeah. we do the decade. Yeah. The decade. Mm -hmm. Well, and if it's if it's a library card for a child, usually those are identified because they're you know somebody has to sign for them. Right. Uh, depending on the library system. But it usually has like number, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners will have the number of programs that were run for children or teens if they separated out that way, and the average number of people who participated, and that kind of gives you a sense. But I think like what Athena was saying, some of the stuff that happens is very much a pickup. When you think about all the people who come to the library after school who are regulars, they might not want to participate in a craft program. They just want to hang out there and like read or talk to their friends or whatever. Is that programming? Well, some might say, well, you know, if you're not taking attendance and you don't have a sign up and they don't leave with a, you know, a, <laughs> it's a watch, you know, <laughs> you know, like a duct tape wallet, then it's all over, you know. But it's service, right? I mean, well, and I think the thing that really resonated with me, and this is something that I think is our next, um, you know, there, there are two things that I could have said that, that really represent our next challenges. The first one is adding more teen services librarians to libraries, because if libraries don't have them, and you pointed out the staffing issue, then your time as a teen services librarian is going to be stretched to cover, um, you know, to cover other, <laughs> other people's things. And then I think the other thing, and this, this might be more so in Boston, um, as kids are, uh, they go to different high schools, they don't necessarily go to their neighborhood high school, and where you live might not necessarily be where you spend most of your time, and, um, and there really is a dearth of opportunity for young people to be places in Boston, especially young people of color. And so I think, um, you know, one of the things that teen librarians need to do is go out more Think about, just like you said, what, um, you know, why aren't these people coming to the library? Well, for young people, it might be because they're engaged somewhere else that they can't leave. <laughs> when I think of those after school programs, like if you leave, you can't come back. And um, so you're not leaving to go to the library where you might be kicked out anywhere, you might not feel welcome. So, um, you know, there might be some real structural things that are keeping young people from coming to the library. And they might be things that you can remedy on site. But they might be other things that have to do with the way other institutions serving you their run. And you know, it might be your responsibility or your service to go out and go to where the young people are and take the resources to them. That was sort of the other question that I had in mind was how much control do you have as a teen librarian versus having to contend with the system that you're working in? Um, and where, where are sort of the tensions with that? system can prevent you from serving your own population. Yeah, there's often tension. I mean, there's the, um, as I, like I said before, we're, we are being encouraged now to go out more. Um, and what's great is that that's, a lot of us, that's our instinct anyhow um, in the work that we do. So that's great. Um, and it kind of coincides with some of the goals. Then there's the staffing issue. Um, and then there's also sort of the kind of outreach you do. There's a, uh, um, like I'm sort of like, all right, if you don't, institution, if you don't want me to come there, now there are other ways we can work together. Do you want me to do some book clubs with you guys? Do you want to come in for a book group sometime? You know, just, I want to work it out, figure it out. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they're like, uh, the, from the library side of it, they're like, no, you must go out there. If you don't go out there, it doesn't count. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I don't know what to do with that then, because I want to serve. You know, so there's there's things like that. Like sometimes they decide some things don't count. Um, or like when you were talking about um, 
you know, uh, sort of like, how do you count when people kind of come into the library and they're just there? Um, we try to find creative ways to do that because in our stats, there's no way to really count that. So like, computer use, and um, and sometimes I'll do like something like, hey guys, trivia time, <laughs> like just like do something to be like, these people were here and I interacted with them, and please count it for something. Um, I think it matters, um, but yeah, there's sometimes tension there, and what they decide is is work, and what I think is worth it. We are a little over time. Um, if there are any last questions, or I also want to respect your time. <laughs> I know that we said we would only be here till 7.30, so um, any last thoughts or questions? OK, well, Thank can we guys. have another?